guys. I know I look a little bit different, but that's okay. If you focus on the content and not me, you guys are gonna be fine. Uh, the next thing I want you to pay attention to on this slide is the blood glucose level. It's very important. You're gonna be questioned on it. You need to know what the normal fasting blood glucose range is. And this one says 74 to 106. And the normal range, depending on the textbook that you're using, it's about 70 to 110. If you're questioned on this, um, there's going to be a variation of about five points and that's normal. So um, as long as you got the 70 to 110 or within that range, within five points, you'll be fine. Don't forget insulin is secreted from the pancreas, the beta cells of the islands of Langerhans. Okay. The next slide, it goes over um, insulin and when it's secreted the most. I want to explain to you how this happened, guys. So insulin is secreted continuously but it's secreted continuously in very very minute amounts and what happens is whenever you eat a food you eat a bolus of food the insulin that's secreted goes from the minute amount to whoosh, shoots up why because obviously if you're eating that means you're going to be having uh higher glucose levels right which means your insulin level has to increase because the insulin is what brings the glucose out of the bloodstream into the tissues where they need to go. So on this slide, it's very important for you to understand this, okay? You expect, this is what's supposed to happen, that even though the insulin levels are being secreted in very, very small amounts, the insulin level increases after the person eats breakfast, increases after ha they have a snack, increases after lunch, and so on. Every time they eat, the insulin level should go up to accommodate whatever they just ate because it's the insulin that brings down the blood sugar level. All right, so let's talk about the onset of disease for diabetes. As I said, guys, I'm looking at the slide, so that's why I keep veering over to the side. But by the time, by the time you guys see this video, um, the slide that I'm looking at, that my, my eyeballs are literally veering off to the side, it's going to be a split screen. So you'll be able to hear my voice and see me if you want, but you'll be able to see exactly what I'm looking at, okay? So please forgive me, I'm new at this. The onset of disease. Again, the islet cell antibodies are present for months to years before symptoms occur. Now we're talking about type one, guys. And how do we know it's type one that we're talking about? Because I said islet cell antibodies. Remember, type one, that's the one that is an autoimmune disease. So that patient's own body is creating antibodies and that's why that patient's not cre um, secreting insulin, not making insulin, or if they are making insulin, they're not secreting it in the amount that would um, keep them alive, okay? So for type one, the islet cell antibodies are present for months to years before symptoms occur. And so what happens, those patients who are type one, they're usually, you know, diagnosed in um, early childhood, and that's where we got the term for um, juvenile onset diabetes because obviously it was patients were diagnosed with this as children. Manifestations develop when the pancreas can no longer produce insulin. Then rapid onset with ketoacidosis. That is very important for you to know, and schools love testing about it. ATI loves testing about it. HESI loves testing about it. Heck. And Clex loves testing about it. So you have to understand this. Patients who are type one, and I said this to you before, you're hearing me say it again, and then when I get into uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, you'll understand it a little bit more, but those patients who are type one, they're the ones who are more likely to go through DKA, which is diabetic ketoacidosis. That's your type one. Your type twos are more likely to go in to HHNKS. So right now we're talking about type one, so we're talking about the diabetic ketoacidosis. Recent history of sudden weight loss, polydipsia, polyuria, polyphagia, uh, they require an exogenous source. Remember I taught you guys what that word exogenous meant. That means from the outside. That means your type one diabetics are not producing insulin or they're not producing near enough insulin to keep them alive. So in order for them to live, they need an X, EX, exogenous source, an outside source of insulin, okay? For them to be alive, patient may have a temporary three to 12 months remission after initial treatment. That's your type one. Now let's talk about type two. 
formerly known as adult onset um, diabetes or non-insulin dependent diabetes. I want you to think about that for a reason, for a minute, excuse me. Why non-insulin dependent? Well, here's why. Our type ones are the insulin dependents. They're the ones without insulin, they will die. Kaput, they're kicking the bucket, right? But remember, our type twos, they don't have to be dependent on insulin. Matter of fact, they don't even have to have diabetes, right? Start exercising, start eating right, and 95 to 98% of those cases, the hemoglobin A1C goes down and bam, they're not diabetic anymore. So that's why the type twos are also known as a non-insulin um, dependent type. Most prevalent uh, type, 90 to 95% of the people who are diabetic, this is the type of diabetes they have. The risk factors, being obese or overweight, having advanced age, having a family history, okay? The prevalence in children is due to obesity. So it used to be that the children who got diabetes is because they were type one. They were born with some kind of autoimmune um, disorder. But what we're finding now that we're in the age of, I don't wanna say the company because I don't wanna get sued, but we're in the age of fast food where children are being obese and there's childhood obesity and along with that childhood obesity comes diabetes, okay? There's greater prevalence for ethnic groups and there are lots of reasons why, but I'll very shortly I'll touch up on it. I want you to think about certain ethnic groups, they live in certain areas. There aren't grocery stores um, near that area where you know they can get fresh produce, vegetables, fruits. There are corner stores where they're you know, being sold high sugary drinks, you have the ice cream man coming around three times a day, etc. And this next slide just goes over your type one and type two diabetes. And it just really gives you a picture of what that pancreas looks like, um, how it's secreted and where you expect the, the, the blood sugar to actually um, have its most effect or its best effect, I should say.